All right. Thank you, Joseph. That sounds really fun. Any more announcements? Yes. One more. Um, so, IG, this is my mother, Beverly Dally, and on. Um, this Thursday on the 13th, she's going to be 100 years old. Uh, we're having a party on the 29th of July. It's going to be a home and house in our backyard, and so you're all welcome to come. Just copy that detail, and I think there'll be an, an announcement in the newsletter. Well, I know I'm going to be there. That that is very really exciting. Bev, happy 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 birthday. Um all right. Oh, okay. All right. Now we would invite you to silence your electronic devices. However, Feel free to post uh, to our social media during the service if you feel moved to share. Uh, we have our own hashtag, hashtag UU Ogden. Um, so feel free to post to that if you'd like. After the service today, please join us in the building across the parking lot, that great big building right there, uh, for some snacks and conversation with our Presbyterian neighbors. To those who are new and to those who are here for the manyth time. Welcome and thank you for coming today. We are so glad that you are here. You are welcome here, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what your background. You are welcome here to join us as we proclaim worth in our spiritual journeys. You are welcome to join us as we sing songs that uplift our very beings. And you are welcome to join us in community as we learn, live, and love together. All are welcome as we worship that which gives us each meaning and value. No matter what you call this building, this hour, or this gathering of people, we worship as one body illuminated by the light of our chalice. At this time, Tim will light our chalice. Please join us in lighting our chalice. The chalice lighting words are in the order of service. We light this chalice for the warmth of love, for the light of truth, and for the energy of action. Thank you, Tim. And now we would like to invite you to rise in body or voice to sing our opening hymn, number 134, Our World is One World. Again, that is hymn number 134 in the gray hardback hymnal. Mm -hmm. But she's 
Today's reading comes from the Reverend Matthew Johnson. I want to say to all those who would close the door, who would be guided by fear instead of hope, who would clutch in scarcity rather than live in generosity, who would say, no, you can't come here. I want to say, how dare you? Listen to the voices. See the faces, open your heart. Lest the tears of the holy drown us all, may we be summoned to a higher calling, one of faithfulness and hospitality and open-hearted love. The best of us and not the worst. Both impulses are in our history and in our present, that colonizing and the nativist, the supremacist, that's part of our history. That part that says difference is scary and there isn't enough and so it's just for us. That is part of who we are, we who live here in this land. But it's only part of our history and only part of our mythos, our story about ourselves. Another part of our story is the welcome. The table open, the door open, the heart open. The embrace of variety and diversity and quintessentially American. The land of freedom, regardless of origin or color or faith. The affirmation that there's plenty, there's enough. Come and be welcome. That's another part of our story. When you give thanks this week, give thanks for the best of our story. Give thanks for those who have made journeys, journeys of time and space and journeys of the heart including yourself. Give thanks that there is plenty. Give thanks for hope and love and possibility. Give thanks for love, which, despite what you might see on the news, is stronger in the end than hate. Give thanks and from the place of gratitude. Open your heart, open your door, be a living witness of the spirit of hospitality. And joyful Thanksgiving, whose bounty we share, come and go with me. Take one more step. When bound to human care and hope, then we are free. An awareness of the truth of our own stories, our own contingency and fragility, our own need to be welcomed. We can see in the faces of one another. We can hear in the voices of one another, the core humanity, our siblings, our family, our neighbor, and say, come, come, whoever you are, you are welcome here. It is my prayer this morning that we heed the words etched on that statue, 
that we have a country where those whose words apply to everyone and not just some, where our hearts are open and our door stands ajar. As the poet wrote, not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that Twin Cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cried she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. May it be, and may we make it so. I would now like to invite up Susan Storr, who will be introducing our guest speaker for today. Rochelle is here with her daughter, Jada, and um, she currently is a case manager at Lantern House. Before that, she had no home with her two children. And uh, she's going to uh, be telling us about her story. And I must tell you, um, if you get on Instagram, there's a site called Invisible People. Go there. It's a series of people who maybe were in Jada's position talking about what it was like. And lastly, um, I was doing errands downtown the other day and I noticed people who were on the street and who are homeless. We have so many and there are so many around this country. Um, we need to fix that. Uh, things are not right. So um, Rochelle, we're just privileged and happy to have you here. Hello, 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 everyone. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> I would first like to um, begin uh, with giving praise to the good Lord for life and love. Um, and just without grace, where would any of us be? So um, and I'd like to thank the university, um, Uni Unitalian, excuse me, Unitarian Universalist yes. Church and its congregation um, for this, this amazing opportunity to come and conversate with you guys today. Thank you, Susan, um, for just making me feel so welcome and comfortable. Um, and now I would like to begin with a couple of confessions. Um, first is I love German shepherds. Um, uh, my favorite colors are crimson and gold and public speaking is not my strong point. So, um, so, but luckily for you guys, I have my cheat sheet, which is these papers right here. So um, yeah, I'm a little unorthodox and all over the place, but that's just me. So um, I would like to begin um, with a story. Um, and that is of a young lady named Mia. Um, Mia was a good, respectful kid, always welcome anywhere she went. And at about the age of eight or nine, Mia began learning how to read music and to play the saxophone. Mia, Mia enrolled her um, into in band, uh, Mia's mother enrolled her into band class as a means to make friends because she was a military brat and always the newbie at every school. So um, Mia caught on to playing the saxophone um, and reading music uh, very well and gracefully worked her way up the musical ranks, um, becoming first chair honor band, jazz band, marching band. I mean, you named it, um, she was doing it. Um, you know, those around her could tell she had the 
sauce. Um, so, but Mia, you know, was always grounded and very unaware of all these talents um, that she possessed. Um, so um, in the beginning stages of learning saxophone, uh, Mia had also, Mia's mother had also placed her um, in to soccer as a way to distract her from the divorce her parents were getting. So um, Mia loves her mother for this because it did. It was a, a total distraction. And Mia only remembers falling in love with soccer during that time. Um, Mia was a natural, just like she was at everything else. Um, she quickly got recruited to a club soccer team um, where they began playing all over the United States. Um, Mia was winning accolades, MVPs. Um, I mean, you name it. Again, she was doing it in the name of soccer. She, she actually was on the Olympic development team, which is the um, uh, ODP soccer team in Colorado. So, um, I mean, like I said, you named it, she, she was doing it. And some other noteworthy accolades, um, I would just like to let you know about Mia is that, you know, she won the Eagle Pride Award. Um, she was on the National Junior Honor Society. Um, she was captain of her high school soccer team, captain of her high, high school basketball team. Um, won defensive MVPs. Um, <clears throat> she was an all-state soccer player from freshman on. Um, also uh, had the privilege of winning a state championship soccer, um, uh, you know, award. So that was awesome for her. Um, I mean, like there's really so many accolades. It's pretty gross, you know, <laughs> you know, this girl just kind of had it going on. Right. So, um, but again, Mia, she's just, you know, a smart, humble, kind, athletic kid. You know, that's Mia. She's just growing up, living life. Um, so Mia would go out to live her life's dreams, um, which was to go to college on a soccer scholarship. Um, her parents were not wealthy enough to send her to college, and she knew the only way she could get there was on a scholarship. So she accomplished that goal um, and was recruited on a full scholarship to the Lee University soccer team in Cleveland, Tennessee. Um, Mia later became captain of that university team. She was an um, all-conference soccer player, all-American, all-American uh, all athlete, um, and she just really, really enjoyed being a student athlete. So Mia would go on to graduate in 2005 with a bachelor's degree in sociology. Um, and after that, Mia decided she was gonna follow in her father's footsteps and join the army. Um, and she did, she joined the army um, and she served to fight for her country against the war on terror. Um, you know, and just like everything else in Mia's life, she put everything into her military career. Um, so in, uh, Mia during basic was elected to be what's called a platoon guide. So in the platoon guide resumes all responsibility, um, for the soldiers under the direction of the drill sergeant. So, I mean, this is an elected position by the peers, but it's also a position that can be taken at any time based on, you know, what you're doing, um, as the platoon guide. So throughout basic and AIT, um, Mia held that ranking, which was something that was never done before on, in Fort Leonard, Missouri, um, which was the uh, duty, I mean, the uh, basic training station she was at. So because of this, Mia received an Army Achievement Medal before she ever even got to her duty station. So, um, you know, moving forward, um, Mia would go on to have a successful um, start to her military career um, in the Army. Um, making the post basketball team, becoming a starter, um, receiving expert marksman badges for every weapon that she shot. Um, she scored over 300 on every PT test. It was a th out of 300. She was scoring over a 300. Um, and Mia had the honor of receiving a second Army Achievement Medal for being the first female to volunteer and complete a live overseas training with the third special forces group of Fort Bragg. So uh, needless to say, Mia was a force to be reckoned with. Um, you know, anything you put in front of her, she was gonna conquer. Um, so moving forward, Mia married the man that she was dating um, while she was in the military. So he was also a soldier too. They later had two children together, a boy and a girl. So I'm gonna shift from Mia for just a second. Um, but I, I really want you guys to keep her in the forefront of your mind. So, you know, as a parent, 
there's an incredible guilt and shame that comes with not being able to provide for your children, especially when you know that you're capable. The feeling just hits different. Um, when you've been homeless once, the fear of being homeless again never goes away. And then when you become homeless again, you lose all hope. You lose hope in yourself and you lose hope in the people that said that they would have your back. And without hope, what is there? So even though my family has come out on the other side, there will always be that lingering feeling of becoming homeless again. And I'll always have that lingering feeling. If I could just go back to that event horizon. Um, so I became homeless after becoming unemployed from what I thought was my career job. And for the protection of that company, we'll just call them the sales center. Um, after working at the sales center for a little under a year, I was promoted into management as a sales coach. And um, as time went on, every sales coach on the floor came from my team. Um, I was very proud of this. I loved my job. I loved my agents. Um, I loved teaching them the secrets of sales, um, just, just everything about it. I loved helping them in their time of need. Um, it was like my second family. And after five years, you know, I was able to bring my children, you know, they're running around doing their thing. It, it was literally a family. Um, so, you know, I'm like, and who could ask for more? Who wakes up every morning saying, I love going to work. You know, that's, <laughs> that's hard. That's hard. Um, so, you know, and I was, I was at that point in my life. Um, and in a strange change of chain of events, an employee of mine, um, you know, had sold me some faulty equipment, HR got involved. Um, and uh, I ended up demoted. So um, the painful part of all of that that happened is that the demotion, it was based off of a lie. Um, and I had a best friend at work um, that, that, that could have reversed that, um, you know, and only the good Lord knows why, why that happened. Um, but uh, that, that changed everything for me. So I did go on to receive unemployment, so that was okay. But at the time, we were doing okay for ourselves. We were actually living in a historic building right here in Ogden, 1500 square feet on the top of Washington Boulevard. Um, but it was something I could not afford on only unemployment. Um, and in a fortunate chain of events, um, I was able to legally terminate that lease, um, you know, due to some code infraction things from the building the same month that I became unemployed. So um, I was luckily able to avoid an eviction on my record because of that. Um, so in the uh, last days of counting down living in our home, um, things became really tense between my husband and I. Um, and instead of staying strong together, um, we grew weak apart. Um, and the kids and I temporarily went to stay with my mother. And the reason why we couldn't go live with her is because she already had seven people living with her and two dogs. So, um, you know, it was, it was a little crowded. So, um, we were temporarily with my mother and my husband was here in Austin couch surfing. Um, and, um, while the kids and I, um, you know, like I said, while the kids and I were here in, well, in Layton, my husband was couch for surfing. And um, that's when I soon found out being homeless in Oglin means you're a criminal. Um, but those details are not mine to share. Um, maybe one day I can get the permission from my husband, you know, to share those with you. Um, but uh, being homeless is not just a problem for the addict, the physically handicapped, or the mentally ill. It can happen to literally anyone. Uh, the average person is two months away from being homeless um, after losing their job or their main source of income. Uprooted, exposed, alienated are a few words that come into mind after becoming homeless. Um, once you become homeless, it is extremely hard to focus on anything that will bring you back to stability. Um, 
the focus becomes on how do I not get hypothermia? How do I not get heat stroke? What rest, what restroom can I use without being judged? Where can I park my car without getting the police called? Um, and all these things just running around constantly in your brain, um, the stress of that begins to cloud your judgment. Um, and then really bad decisions are easily made. Um, so the longer I was homeless, the more difficult it became to become, get back into the mainstream. Um, constant obstacles chip away at your self-esteem. Um, and then you, you really just begin to fade away into the abyss. And, and that's what I did. Um, you, you just wanna be invisible. I was so embarrassed for my children. I always wondered the stress they endured going to school when their friends and peers would ask them, where do they live? I knew their only choices were to lie or say they were staying at a homeless shelter. Um, and they never should have had to go through that. Uh, what a crappy parent. You can't even keep a roof over your children's head. You and your husband are veterans. You have a college degree and you can't even find a job. You and your husband failed as parents. Who even are you? All of that talent gone to waste. You should just disappear. Homelessness is a vicious circle of a cycle. And those thoughts were constantly on repeat in my head. So if I haven't made the connection, I am Mia. So um, they were on repeat even when we got rehoused. They actually got worse because they were never addressed. So I was stuck in the depression, unable to get out. And with the help of a nonprofit, we did move into that home. But again, I was only on my unemployment um, and I expressed those concerns, but those concerns, um, uh, you know, were not heard for whatever reason. And um, within six months, we had no car and we were receiving a three day notice to pay or vacate. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and yet again, the cycle, the vicious circle of a cycle had started all over again. Um, and anyways, um, so, you know, Ken and I, we were going through our battles. Um, we were unable to maintain stable employment um, and um, embarrassed to go back to the Lantern House. Um, we found out a brand new program called Family Promise which I was introduced to your great church. Um, and for the next three months, me and my family went from church to church. Um, and it was really in this program that I did feel welcome and I did to gain back some of that confidence that I had lost um, from being homeless. Um, I gained full-time employment at Linquist. Um, being a gardener, I was receiving case management, which was the piece that was missing the first time around. Um, and, but the only downside to that was now I no longer had a car and I was using transit and half of my employment, the money I was making from employment went to transit, like literally almost half of it. Um, at the very least, we were spending 20 bucks a day on the four of us getting back and forth. Um, and, you know, that, um, yeah, that, that was trying. So we were, we were not able to really save um, anything while being in the family promise program. So, and that was a three month program and we timed out of that program. Um, and luckily um, I moved from uh, my job at Linquist to another job where I was able to make a little bit more money um, and I was able to save. And so when we timed out, we moved into a hotel. So we were still homeless. Um, and uh, we, I was able to maintain that hotel for about a year. Um, and, uh, the, uh, good thing once we moved to the hotel, um, uh, I had a brand new car. Um, but after about that year, um, you know, maintaining, saving food, it just, it becomes impossible. Um, and again, 
the vicious circle of the cycle again began. And we made the decision to go back to the Lantern House. Um, so now this is three, three times in a homeless shelter. Um, and now with my pride at an all time low, I thought this was gonna be just our way of life. This, this was it, this was, this was how our life was moving forward. Um, and now I was working for a new company. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Oh, just like I got my cheat sheet. <laughs> um, so, um, um, Oh, I guess I'm on the last page. <laughs> so um, I'm sorry, I got a little sidetracked. But um, you know, now we are um at our third, our third round, go round at the shelter. But throughout this time, you know, we had angels like yourself um that never left my side. But two, two individuals I would really, really like to give praise to um is Carissa Redding, Cindy Bray, and the whole Odyssey Elementary staff. Um, they they really came through for us and our family. Um, they gave us hope. Um, they gave me their time, which was the most important. Time is everything. Nobody has time for anything. And when you are just so down and out and so low, that time that somebody gives you is just so important. And it makes you feel so important. Um, they believed in me. They were patient. And it takes a community to bring people out of homelessness. Um, the third time around was the charm. Um, because I received what's called wraparound services. So home, being homeless is not just the one, it's not just one problem. There's this vast majority of this, like that, that cycle, that circle of a cycle I was talking about. And there's all these things that are wrong and more things keep happening and more things get piled on and more things get piled on. Um, and until, right, you, you just have no, no idea what to do. And it takes somebody from the outside looking at a different perspective, working with you to get you out of that. Um, so um, um, now it's my job to house people. And Suzanne already did let you know that I am on my third year working at the Lantern House. Um, so for the uh, first two years, I was the family case manager. And just last month, I was promoted um, to the lead housing case manager. Um, every, everything is on the up and up. Ken and I um, will be celebrating 17 years of marriage in December. My baby girl, Jada, will be going to high school. My son will be going to middle school. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I, I even though I know I've said, you know, Mia was me, um, I, a reason why I was telling all those stories about Mia, because I think that's so important. It doesn't, anybody can be homeless, like at the snap of a finger. Um, and then know that confident person I was, like, again, just like Thanos, snap of a finger was gone. It, she was gone. Um, nowhere to be found. And who, who would have ever guessed that? Right. Like, um, so but now the best part about this story um, is that I am living out my purpose. Um, I had the opportunity to live that. So now when I have all of my guests and my clients in front of me, um, you know, I'm able to tell them my story. I'm able to tell them I live through this and I know how to get out of it. Um, and I know how to be successful after it, um, even though it did take the three times. But now I'm, my job is to make it one time now for every person that's in front of me instead of taking those three times. Cause again, and you know, those things are always gonna be there. They're always gonna chip away at me. Um, but um, it's, it's just an honor um, to have this task, um, you know, to, to help the homeless. Um, it, like I said, it's just, it's just the best honor. And um, you know, that's, that is what it's like being homeless in Ogden. Um, and I'd just like to thank you all for, for listening to my story. Thank you so much, Rochelle, uh, Rochelle, for sharing that. Um, seems like you went through a lot, but 
We are very glad that things are looking very bright in your future um, for you and your family. Um, and now let us pray together. Spirit of life, love, and community. We come here today to feel peace, to feel a sense of belonging, and to feel loved. But we know that there are those who feel left out, who have not found that community of hope that we have here. It is all too easy at times to get comfortable in our own situations and to ignore or become complacent about others who have less. May our eyes and our hearts be ever open to those in need. May we always have empathy and compassion for those struggling through life and ignite in us the courage and desire to help in whatever manner we can. May those in need find the hope and resources that can help comfort them. And may we be the first in line to give aid. May we put aside our own prejudices and arrogance and reject the hatred and fear of the world in order to better help our homeless neighbors. We pray for those individuals and families facing the hardest moments of their life, that they may be reminded that they are not alone. Bless them that their hearts may be lifted, that joy will find them once again, and that they may be shown the goodness of humanity. And may we always find ways to build bridges and hold hearts. Blessed be and amen. And now let us pause. We each come here with our own circumstances and people close in our minds for reasons of joy or sorrow. Please take a moment now to speak their names aloud, lifting them up into our sacred space. Blessings on those named and blessings too on those who named them. Join me now in silent meditation or prayer. May it be so, and blessed be. You are now invited to come forward to light a candle of hope, memory, or gratitude. You may also wish to drop a stone of burden or forgiveness into our sacred gathered waters. Thank 
Thank you, everyone. Far too often, we are forced to confront some of the terrible things in life. And when these things happen, all we can do is come together in places like this church to remind ourselves that there is still hope. There is still love. There are still good-hearted people who can look unblinking into the storm and continue to believe a calm, bright morning will come. This community is a refuge where we can keep the ember of hope alive when all the world seems intent on dousing it. And then we can use our light ember to light a beacon for the rest of the world. Our offerings each week sustain this community so we can share our small embers to light a dark world. Please give generously so that we can all together help spread that light. Thank you. Thank 
Now, please rise in body or voice and facing the center aisle, sing together the offering song printed in your order of service. Ron, you we offer thanks for this generous offering. We bless it and promise to use it wisely to further the work of this church. Now, please remain standing as we sing our closing hymn today, which is number 311 in the Great Hardback Hymnal. Let it be a dance. Let it be a dance with you. May I have to dance with you? Let a dancing song be heard. Play the music, say the words. Learn to follow the A child is on the old. We are without the Go forth in simplicity. Find and walk the path that leads to compassion and wisdom, that leads to happiness, peace, and ease. Welcome the stranger and open your heart to a world in need of healing. 
Be courageous before the forces of hate. Hold and embody a vision of the common good that serves the need of all people. We hope that you have enjoyed the service today. Please join me now in extinguishing our chalice by saying together the chalice's extinguishing words printed in your order of service. We extinguish this chalice, but not the lines of love, the light of truth, nor the energy of action. Thank you very much. Please go in peace. Yeah, I think it's okay to stay in the water and take us into this.